y'all, welcome back. I'm Mama Dr. Jones, a board certified OBGYN and mom to four. And today we're talking about the COVID vaccination and if it can cause infertility. Where did this claim come from? Is there anything to actually back it up? And what do you need to know? Of note, my good friend and fertility doctor, Natalie Crawford, MD, who also has a YouTube channel, has made a great video on this as well. So after you watch this one, if you want a second opinion, hop on over to her channel and check it out. I will link her video in the description box below. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. We talk about all things reproductive health, pregnancy, gynecology, periods, and so much more. We'd love to have you. Now let's jump into the video. As always, nothing in this video is meant to serve as medical advice specifically for you. This should just be a jumping point for you to get more information and have a conversation with your own doctor or advanced practice provider. All of this information is rapidly changing and this is up to date to the best of my ability as of the day of upload. So where do these claims come from? The basis of these claims is a real wormhole of misinformation and confusing kind of thinking out loud posts from people who just post in Reddit threads and things like that. They are scientists, and so it makes sense to at least read them and understand where the concerns are coming from. But I do want to note right out the gate, there's no scientific evidence of anything that's being claimed in the blog post that made these initial claims, which basically went viral. That initial blog post was posted with a title that said, former head of Pfizer research says that COVID vaccine causes infertility. So let's just start with who this person is. Not because an ad hominem attack is the right way to go against misinformation, but I do think it's important to know where this information is coming from. This person has not worked for Pfizer in at least nine or 10 years. And so they are not someone that is really close to the vaccine development or anything like that, even though the title is somewhat misleading when you read it, because it kind of seems like they might be a little more adjacent to it. It's also somebody who has made claims very recently that the pandemic is effectively over and not something that we need to worry about anymore. So I just think it helps to understand the mindset of the person who is making these claims. Now this post contained a lot of information. Now I'm simply gonna focus on the one where they say that, oh my gosh, the vaccine causes infertility. Let me read you what they say in the post. The vaccinations are expected to produce antibodies against spike proteins of SARS-CoV-2. This is true. We talked about this in my last COVID vaccination video. The way that this vaccine works is by mRNA, which is a message to your own body to produce antibodies, which keep the spike protein of coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 from entering into your respiratory system. So that's accurate so far. However, spike proteins also contain syncytion one homologous proteins, which are essential for the formation of the placenta in mammals such as humans. It must be absolutely ruled out that a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 could trigger an immune reaction against syncytion one, as otherwise infertility of indefinite duration could result in vaccinated women. There's a lot to tackle in that. So first we need to talk about what is syncytion one. This is a protein that is integral to placental development in the embryo. And it is basically used to get the placenta to effectively attach to the uterine wall so that the embryo can continue growing past about eight or nine weeks. The idea that these two proteins are so similar that your antibodies could mount an immune response is a bit of a extremist claim. Are they similar? They do have some similarities but a lot of viruses have similarities. So they would need to be extremely similar. And we're just not finding that when you actually look at the genetic sequencing of the spike protein on SARS-CoV-2 and the syncytion one protein that they're talking about. This would almost be like claiming that you could get vaccinated against Ebola and that would protect you against SARS-CoV-2 because those are also relatively similar. So this is not really a claim that we've seen substantiated not only in this exact topic, but really in any other topic of discussion as far as other viruses and vaccines being able to protect against similarly homologous proteins. So it is a little bit of a outrageous claim that comes with really no scientific basis. They don't have any evidence of this. It's basically someone thinking out loud about what ifs. So I agree, we should definitely be considering this as a possibility. We should be you know, keeping an eye on that, but you can't just make these claims and say that people shouldn't be vaccinated because of this. Should we study it and make sure? 
Absolutely. Is the biologic plausibility high enough that this should be a concern that keeps you from being vaccinated, particularly when the antibodies they are claiming would mount an immune response against that syncytion one protein are the same antibodies you would make if you got a natural COVID infection. So it would make sense to think about this from the aspect of, well, if those antibodies from a vaccine would mount an immune response against syncytion one after vaccination, you should be seeing that same effect from antibodies of people who have had COVID. So let's talk about that. Are there people who have had COVID who then go on to have infertility? This is also a little bit of a touchy subject for me because the way that this would actually work with the syncytion one protein would not be to cause infertility. It would be to cause miscarriage. The placenta doesn't really fully develop and start growing the embryo until nine weeks or so. And if you had a placenta problem, it wouldn't cause you to not be able to become pregnant, which is infertility. It would cause problems with the placenta or miscarriage. So have we seen people who have COVID-19 end up having a higher chance of miscarriage? I have made a video on this before and the evidence is a little bit lacking still. However, the evidence that we have right now does not support an increased risk of early miscarriage, which is what this would cause in people who've had COVID-19. Meaning, people who've had COVID-19 and have these antibodies are not having increased risk of miscarriage. So why then would we think that people who have antibodies from the vaccine will be at higher risk of miscarriage? Could this change? Could we get some information that we don't have right now? Absolutely, this is pandemic medicine and that could happen. Do I think it's likely that that will happen? Absolutely not. It does not seem that the biologic plausibility is high enough and it is not substantiated by the current evidence we have regarding COVID-19 infection. Additionally, if we do wanna talk about it from an infertility angle, even though that's really not what antibodies to syncytion one, if they existed, would cause, we have people who, even though it was highly recommended against and they had to sign paperwork saying they would be on a reliable form of birth control, who in the studies were vaccinated against COVID-19 and ended up having surprise pregnancies. You would really not expect to see that if there was a vaccine causing infertility, right? You wouldn't expect to see that even though people were on contraception or said they were on contraception and were specifically told to avoid pregnancy during the trial, ended up getting pregnant. It's only a small number in the trial, but it's still enough for us to go, you know, I don't know that that really makes sense. So I think there's a lot of information that really debunks this claim as having any substantial evidence at this point. Again, should we continue to research this? Absolutely. Should we hold off on vaccinating against a pandemic virus that is both deadly and dangerous because of some claim that is essentially pulled from thin air? I don't think so. I think that is the wrong way to look at this. I do think it is really interesting as well to think about these people who are making claims about how antibodies to the vaccine would cause all of these problems are also telling people that they don't need to worry about COVID-19 or try to avoid infection when it absolutely makes complete sense that antibodies to infection would react exactly the same as antibodies that your body made in reaction to the vaccine. So it's very incongruent messaging, right? They're, they're very worried about antibodies, but only when they come from the vaccine, which doesn't make sense because it's the same antibody that's made just in a little slightly different way, but it is the same exact antibody when your body makes it. So that is a little bit of an incongruent message to me that is concerning and just adds another layer of this unsubstantiated evidence is being given by people who seem to have an ulterior motive. How are we going to continue to gather information on this? There are ongoing data collection from both the trials that were done, so everybody who got the vaccine in the original trials is being followed extensively, as well as post-licensure data collection for anybody who has received the vaccine under the emergency use authorization from the FDA. You can, if you've gotten the vaccine and when you do get your vaccine, enter any side effects or complications that you're having into vSafe, which I will link below, which is a data tracking place for vaccine side effects. So please feel free to register for that, enter any side effects that you might be having and contribute to this data collection because I do think it's important. I do think we need to continue to be curious and get this information. But at the same time, this is pandemic medicine and we need to get our 
people back to a place of safety. So I think that the vaccine is safe. I don't think that there is enough substantiation of these claims for people to avoid vaccination for this reason. And I hope that you will consider getting a second opinion from Dr. Natalie Crawford if you're still concerned about it. I have mostly been talking about infertility in females in this video, but there is also some discussion about male infertility or lower sperm counts. And we see this with a lot of viruses. Viral infections often cause decreases in sperm count until the person is completely recovered. This is not usually permanent, although there are some rare infections that can cause permanent infertility or lower sperm counts, but it's, it's usually something that is recoverable. So there's an ongoing clinical trial right now looking at this uh, for both COVID and for COVID vaccination in people and their sperm counts. So I think that's worth, you know, being aware of, but I think the fact that we're seeing that with the infection is more of a reason to look into this with the vaccine than when we're not seeing it with the infection in like, you know, production of pregnancies or miscarriage and things like that. So in conclusion, we know COVID-19 is dangerous. We know this vaccine is effective at preventing severe COVID-19 infection. The trials indicated overwhelming efficacy as well as safety of this vaccine. And at this time, the biologic plausibility and thinking out loud about the potential side effect of infertility is not enough, in my opinion, to encourage people to avoid vaccination because of that. I think that is a dangerous road to take given how unlikely that would be as a side effect. So I hope you will grab a second opinion from Dr. Natalie Crawford if you so wish. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Thank you so much for being here today. If you wanna subscribe, we would love to have you. Be kind to yourself, to each other, to me. In the comments, be kind, and I will see you next time. My camera's too far away to put my hand over today. Bye.